because the true, real church of Jesus Christ is still standing. It will never be demolished. It will never be diminished. It will never stop fighting. We are warriors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, uh, what, what's the song we sang earlier? Press the battle on. Amen. Forward, forward is the battle cry. Forward, forward, let's go. Hey, maybe a few might fall on my right and my left, but guess what? I'm still going. I'm not going to stop. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning broadcast. Pastors David and Donna Spearman welcome you. Welcome to Kingdom First, located here in Fort Wayne. As we say, God loves Fort Wayne. But now, let's get into this power pack message. Forward, forward is the battle cry. Onward, onward to our own.
For those who are watching by streaming live, we want to say thank you for watching us today. God bless each and every single one of you. Get prepared for a message I believe that will benefit you, bless you, encourage you, strengthen you, and take you over the hump, as they say. So let's get ready. Let's get to it. Um, we're still talking about Jesus the healer. That's our overall theme of these messages is Jesus the healer. And we're on part two of Wilt Thou Be Made Whole? And it's found over in John chapter 5, verse 1 through 9. And it reads this way. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. 
When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered to him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And the day was the Sabbath. Now, we spoke about this last week. We talked about the sheep gate. Maybe I spent too much time last week on the sheep gate. We talked about the fact that it, around Jerusalem, the wall of Jerusalem, there were 10 gates. The sheep gate was, the, uh, was one of those. And we, uh, we found out and we learned over Nehemiah that uh, Eliashib, who was the high priest at that particular time when Nehemiah was building the wall, he and the, it was the high priest and the priest who built the sheep gate or rebuilt the sheep gate. And they consecrated it, or they set it apart as holy. And that's the only gate that was set apart as holy. We learned that that was the gate by which all of the um, animals came through. That was the gate they came through for the sacrifice. That's why they had made it holy, or, or set it apart for the sacred use, consecrated it, so that these animals that were coming through, that, that coming through it, they were coming through a consecrated or holy gate for, and ready for sacrifice. So there was a whole lot there. We talked about how Jesus and, his, and what he is to the sheep gate and he's the Lamb of God and so forth and so on. Don't want to go all over that again. Uh, we, we, we talked about how the, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the law of first things or the law of the firstborn where all the first things belong to God. Jericho, when they first went into the promised land, belonged to God. He said, it belongs to me. He says, so you have to kill everything and, and destroy everything because that's mine. The rest of the land is yours. Uh, God says over in Exodus uh, 13 about the fact that we are to give the first things unto God, the first of our fruit, the first of our crop, the first of our paychecks. Everything, the first belongs to God. Even our first child belongs to God. And that one is the one we redeem. He says, uh, 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 if you have a donkey, who's the first? And you don't want to redeem him. In other words, you know, take a lamb for in place of the donkey for, for sacrifice. He said, then you have to break his neck because it belongs to me. And then and now, and that gives us a greater understanding of the whole process of the 10th plague in Egypt, which was the death of the firstborn because the first things belong to God. And since all Egypt, Egypt had not redeemed their firstborn, then the curse was the fact that or the plague was the fact that God took the firstborn of people, cattle, everything, and they all died. The Israelites, on the other hand, took the blood of a lamb with no blemish, put it on the doorpost and the lintel. That blood of the lamb was the redemption price of them or their firstborn. Now, you could have been an old man, but if you were firstborn because you had not been redeemed in Egypt at that time, you died. All right? So they put the blood of the lamb, which that was the redemption price. Jesus, is the, Jesus shed his blood. He's the, he's the lamb of God, as John says. And his shed blood, the blood of the lamb, redeems us. And we're redeemed by his blood. And so we are saved. So they all, all this down through history, God has the same theme all down through history. Anyway, I don't want to continue on with that. I, I, I want to labor in that. I just want to show you that. And also we talked about how God does unusual things down throughout history, how he's done un, uh, unusual ways of healing. So when we talk about the water being stirred in the pool, that might seem unusual, but God is not, God is an unusual God. He's not beyond doing something spectacular. He's not beyond doing something strange. He does as he chooses to do. Amen? Amen. All right. And, and I gave you the scripture last week in Isaiah 55, 8, 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and no, nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And the whole idea here and the point here is that God, God is God. And there's no way you can think on his level. You just cannot think on his level. You know, you are limited. You are a finite human being. Not only are you a finite human being, but your body is racked with sin. Now you're saved, praise God, but your, 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 your flesh is still corrupt. So your ways and your thoughts aren't going to be his. But 
through the process of our sanctific sanctification, remember there's justification, you're declared not guilty because of the blood of Jesus. Sanctification is you're set apart and you're, you're now uh, going toward living and being like Jesus Christ. So through the process of sanctification, we're becoming more like Christ every day, putting aside the old man and living according to the new man in Christ. Amen? All right, so let us get to the, the whole story here that I really want to get to, and that is what happened with this man, all right? Obviously, one thing about this is time did not diminish this man's faith because for 38 years, he was going to, the, we, we can assume that he was going to this pool. I don't want to make an assumption, but we can see based on how the story is written that he had been coming there for a long time and probably all of his life trying to get delivered. It tells me, that, that right there tells me we never ought to give up. We never ought to quit. We never ought to say, man, you know, this is, the, this is just not working for me. I, I, I'm done. And one of the things that happens in especially the modern day church is we give up too easily. We call it quits way before we ought to. Sometimes your blessing is just around the corner. Sometimes that anointing is just coming from, you know, it, it reminds me always of Daniel. When, when, when Daniel had, was praying for the revelation of a particular thing and he wanted this revelation and the angel finally came three weeks later. But he didn't quit praying. He didn't quit believing. He was fasting and praying for three weeks. He would have continued fasting and praying until he got the answer. And he continued doing this. And when he finally got the answer, the angel, first thing the angel said was, I was dispatched from heaven the moment you began to pray. But I was sidelined. I got into a fight. You ever get into a fight? You're on your way home from school. You're supposed to be home at a certain time, but... All of a sudden, you get a little waylaid because somebody talked about your mama at school. <laughs> somebody said something about your mama, or your family, or your sister, or your brother, whatever. And all of a sudden, and they kept going, and you're trying to get home because mama said be home at a certain hour, a certain time. And you're trying to get home, but somebody said something that wasn't right. And you just have to respond. <laughs> and, and so you turn around and you start and you, you, you start wailing on them and they start wailing on you, whatever the case may be. And, by the t and, then, and then, you know, you, you get home and your mother say, well, you know, you were supposed to be home at such and such time. You say, but mama, I, I got sidetracked. Well, that's what the angel was telling Daniel. I got sidetracked. I got into a fight. I was sent to, to, to bring this message to you. He said, but on the way, he said, some demons came up and I had, to work my, I had to work my way through these demons. I had to fight. I had to, I had to throw some tough punches, man. I, we, we, were, we were scrapping. We were going at it. He said, and the only reason I'm here now is because my boy saw me. He came over, and I said, well, you take care of these while I go and finish delivering my message. <laughs> and so it, it, you, you, you get it, and it's that, it's that same thing. And so he, he finally got to Daniel. He delivered the message, gave him the revelation that he wanted, and so forth. But the point was that the angel was dispatched the moment he started praying. But he didn't receive the answer until three weeks later. And sometimes there's, God is answering you, and he's giving you the thing you require, but something gets in the way along the line. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to stop you from receiving. It just means that the angels who are delivering the message to you, the angels who are delivering the finances to you, the angels who are delivering the thing that you need, they, are get, they might get a little waylaid. They might have to do a little fighting because, after all, the devil is the prince of the power of the air of, of this atmosphere. And we have to realize that any angel that is coming from heaven to bring, bring something to us, they're going to try and stop them. Why? Not because... Now, they could care less whether you have it or not, but to derail your faith, right, right. to keep you from continually believing. And that's what happens to us on a regular basis. So one of the things that you have to do always is keep believing. Yeah. Be determined that what God has said he's going to do for you, he is going to do for you, and it doesn't matter how long it takes. This man said, God is going to bless me, and he waited 38 years. But he had an appointment with God on that day. Amen? Amen. 
In fact, the Bible says in Luke 18, 1, then he spoke, talking about Jesus, a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Men always ought to pray and not lose heart. How often, you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to, but, but think about it. How often have you lost heart? How often have you given up? So obviously, time did not diminish his faith in God. Amen? We have to keep the faith no matter the length of time. And we do that until we receive. We don't stop until we get it. We don't stop until we get it. We cannot let our faith wane. We cannot give up. Don't lose heart. Out of this multitude of sick and diseased people, none of them recognized Jesus. Because if they had, forget the water, I'm going to the source. Because Jesus is the source, amen? He was the king of kings walking among them. He could have healed all of them with just a word. He's the originator of all life. He is life. But their attention was on the water. Their attention was, when this water gets stirred, I'll get it. And all they had to do was look, turn around and they would have saw the originator of the stirring of the water. They were so focused on this pool being stirred that they missed the source of all power. They missed God. How often are we so focused on our way? How often are we focused on what we think about, what we think should happen? What we think about something? How we think that thing should go? How often do we try and tell God how to move on our behalf? God is set to move, but we're looking, he's set to move over here, but we're looking over here. He's doing something over this side, and, and our attention is focused over here. And so the thing that God is trying to get our attention, you know, at and, and, and give to us, we're so focused over here, we miss it. It passes us by. And then we say, why didn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't God do what he said he was going to do? He did. You missed it. Sometimes we need to put the blame on ourselves. Amen? We are so focused on our own way, what we think should happen, how we think it should happen. Well, Lord, now I want you to do it this way and, and, and bring it like this, this, and, and wrap it up in this kind of package. And God is like, no, that's not how it's coming. I have a better way. It may seem a little strange to you, but I have a better way. Now, Jesus is not there at that particular place at the pool of Bethesda by accident. He's not there just kind of because he was just kind of strolling along and said, ooh, look at that, the pool of Bethesda. Let me, let me, I think I'll go check that out. No. Jesus never did anything by chance. He never did anything by accident. All right? He's, he, everything Jesus did and everywhere he went was a divine appointment. He just didn't stumble upon this man who had been lame for 38 years. That was this man's divine appointment. His faith had brought Jesus to that place. I'm going to say that again. His faith had brought Jesus to that place. So here's Jesus at this time of festival. He comes through the sheep gate. He goes to the pool of Bethesda. He is, he has, he is laser focused on what his assignment is, what his, where his appointment's at, and who his appointment is with. Because God has let him know there's a man sitting by the pool of Bethesda and he needs you to tell him to rise, take up his bed, and walk. And Jesus said to the Father, okay, I'm on my way. So this was a divine appointment. Listen, God does not just do things willy-nilly. You have a divine appointment with him. And everything that's going on in your life, God has set someone or something to come along and meet your need. And many times we miss him meeting our need because here again, we're focused somewhere else. We're in a whole different time zone. 
And God is saying, I need you here at this point in time because that's where your appointment is. And we miss that appointment. We miss that appointment. Let's not miss that opportunity. God does not do things by chance, and he does not do things by accident. Jesus is, was in the right place at God's time. When he comes to meet you, he's at the right place at God's time. You need to know that you can pray and believe God, and you ought to pray and believe God, but God has an appointment with you at a certain time. You may not always know when that appointment is, but just be ready. Be ready for that appointed time when God is going to be there in your bedroom or in your, uh, you know, in your car or wherever it may be. He's going to show up because that is your appointed time. He has already designed it that way. And he's designed it so that when it is done, it will not only, not only bring the blessing to you, but it will bring glory to him. When we look at this crippled man, and all the people who, the multitude, the Bible said it was a multitude around this pool. Jesus could have picked anybody. But the appointment was with this man. With this man. And when he was healed, the first thing the Pharisees said to him, because it was on the Sabbath day, and he was carrying his bed, said, don't you know it's against the rules to carry your bed on the Sabbath day? He said, but a man told me to get up, take up my bed, and walk. And that's what I did. Who was that guy? I don't know. But he told me to get up, and I got up after 38 years. Come on, somebody. So now that Jesus has reached his appointment, he sees the subject and already knows the man's condition. Jesus already knew the man's condition. 38 years, a cripple but he wanted to be healed. You don't go to the pool of Bethesda for 38 years looking for healing unless you believe God. Unless you believe this is going to happen for me. Amen? I don't know about you, but I know I can identify with the lame man. I can identify with him. Like him, we're helpless. Like him, we are weak. Like him, we are crippled. Like him, we are lame because that's what sin does to you. Sin makes you helpless, weak, crippled, and lame. And the only person, the only person who can defeat all that stuff is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. We can find ourselves sometimes paralyzed with fear, paralyzed, with, it doesn't matter, with fear or whatever it may be. We are paralyzed at times, unable to do what we ought to do. Because for many of us, our spiritual lives are like this man's physical life. He was lame, and a lot of us spiritually are lame. Like I said, this is a divine appointment. Jesus was sent to the Father to help him. So the question for all of us is, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? I'm going to be honest with you, there are a lot of folks who don't want to be healed. I'm not talking about some sinner who don't believe in the word of God. I'm talking about even some church folk. There are people who don't want to be healed. They don't want the divine help for their problems. They would much rather stay weak and helpless. In fact, they love it. They love it. You know why? Because sometimes when you're weak and helpless, you get a lot of attention. Weakness and helplessness can bring, bring attention that many people want. That, they, they want that kind of attention. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, look at you. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible what happened to you. And we say, yes. Yes, child. But the Lord is helping me through it. And we say those things, and God is looking and waiting to deliver you, but we, we spurn his, his deliverance. We, we spurn, oh, yeah, yeah, pray for me, but we really don't want prayer. 
When somebody says, hey, you know, God will do it for you. We say, yes, child, I know, he, I know he's able. But in our minds we say, but he's not really willing. I'm just telling you like it is. You don't have to be a devil to not want the things of God. You can be saved sitting in the pew in church and not want it. Because sometimes the weakness and helplessness massages your ego. You feel good about the attention. Some would turn their backs on a way of deliverance. It would work because they did not want to, just because they didn't want to be healed. Some are not ready to admit that they cannot make it on their own even. And that's probably most of us. It's tough for us to admit that we can't make it on, my, on our own. Oh, you, you, you know, we, we, you know we, we, with God's help, we can do it. Well, you know, I, I, got, I, got, I got to try it for me first. I got to do it for me. I, I love hearing people, <laughs> I, I, they, they shouldn't say it, but I love hearing people when they say, you say, yeah, you, you need Jesus. Well, I, I got to straighten myself up first. Well, you can't straighten yourself up. There's no way. You can't make your, yourself right before God so that he, he, that's why God says, I take the, the weak, I take the miserable, I take the sin-filled, I, I, I take all that, I, I, I'll take any and everybody as long as they're willing to come and let me straighten them out. Amen. God will do the straightening out. All you got to do is come as you are. That's why Jesus said, come, you are weak and, and, and heavy laden. He said, come and I'll, I'll, I'll give you rest. Because you're not going to find rest on your own. It's just not going to work. Do you want to be healed? Yes, I, yes, yes, Pastor. Yes, I want to be healed. I've tried and done everything I know. I, I, I've, I've, just, I've just given up. I have no hope. I don't see how it's going to happen. The doctor said this. This is how it looks. I want to be healed, but I don't see how. I don't see any way that it's going to be accomplished. I don't see how God can do it. Because that's what we're really saying. I don't see how God can make it happen for me. I don't see how God can do it. Well, that's not the kingdom attitude. That's not the kingdom way. That's not kingdom thinking. That's, that's garbage thinking. That's, in fact, let me tell you, that's the world's way of thinking. Because that's why the world turns its back on God, because they don't see how God can, can change. They don't see how God can change any of this. I see it. You know, let me, let me share something with you real quick. I'm going to go off script here a little bit. Let me share something with you. You know, we look at our times we live in, and we say these are terrible times, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're terrible times. I mean, this is, this, the world is in rough shape. That ought to make us glad. Huh? That ought to make us happy. Why, Pat, wait, whoa, wait a minute. How, why should I be happy that the world is in bad shape? Because now we can show them how bad a shape they're in based on what the Word of God has to say. We can reveal to them the goodness of God. We can show them the bright light at the end of the tunnel. We can t share, uh, share with them that there is darkness and they can see their darkness. They can feel their darkness. We can show them the glorious light of God and show them the difference between the two and many will come running to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But instead what we do is we begin to look, oh yeah, it's so bad out there. Praise God, it's bad. Now we can show them what real life is all about. Now we can show them the life of God. We can show them the light that they so desperately need. See, it's just like we look at the church today. And man, I tell you what, there's pastors are falling out like, like apples fall off a tree. During, during, during the harvest season. Man, I'm telling you, pastors are falling out, man, with all kind of crazy stuff they've been doing. And everybody says, oh, man, look at the state of the church. Oh, the church is in terrible shape. No, the church is in great shape. The church is in good shape. It's like a company. And you've got a lot of top-heavy dead weight. They're not doing anything. They're not accomplishing the objective of the company. 
They're not fulfilling the obje uh, objective of the company has to make so many things and, and produce, and, you know, make so much money. And they're not doing that. They're sucking up money rather than producing. And so what does a CEO, if he's a smart CEO, what does he do? He goes through and he begins to get rid of people. You, you got to go. I looked at your numbers. You definitely got to go. <laughs> you got to go too. And, and we say, oh, but these are pastors of big churches. God is not concerned with a big church. God is concerned with, are you standing for the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and living that gospel yourself? Listen, I'm here to tell you, you know, God loves the small church. God loves the big church. He loves any, of, all of, any and all of his churches. The deal is, is not the size What's the old saying? It's not the, size of the, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. We may be a small dog, as they say, but we got a whole lot of fights. We've got a whole lot of fights. We will tackle. If God says, go get them, we're going to get them. It doesn't matter how many there are and how big they are. We're going to get them. We look, we, look at the, we look at Satan and his army, and, we, and people say, oh, man, how can you ragtag group of people go after Satan and his well-organized army? Easy. We run in with the gospel of Jesus Christ, holding the banner high. Amen. Glory to God. And we run in saying, and, and, hey, as, as Gideon said, as, as the folks with Gideon said, for the sword of the Lord and Gideon, we say, for the sword of the Lord and Jesus. And we run into that fight preaching and speaking the word of God, dispatching demons all over the place. That's what we, what we do. That's who we are. If you've got the fight in you, you will win. But if you have no fight, you're going to lose. That's what makes the world so effective. They got a lot of fight, but we got more. We've got more. But see, if you're in a church where there ain't no fight... Yeah, you're going to lose. Yeah, pastors are falling out all over the place. Like I said, like ripe apples falling off a tree. That's okay. Because if they're dead weight, they need to be gotten rid of. Because the true, real church of Jesus Christ is still standing. It will never be demolished. It will never be diminished. It will never stop fighting. We are warriors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, uh, what, what's the song we sang earlier? Press the battle on. Amen. Forward, forward is the battle cry. Forward, forward, let's go. Hey, maybe a few might fall on my right and my left, but guess what? I'm still going. I'm not going to stop. Amen. Amen. So the question again is, do you want to be healed? Then fight for it. Don't let the, when the devil talks in your ear, talks in your head and start telling you, oh, you can't do it, you can't make it, oh, look at you, look, look, look at you, look at you, look at you. Tell him, shut up, because I'm not looking at me, I'm looking at Jesus. He's the author and finisher of my faith. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. He's Jehovah Rapha. Come on, somebody. We get so caught up in stuff and we think, oh, well, yeah, you know, I, 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 we got caught up in the world. So I, I can control this. I, let me tell you something. You think you're in control of something that really has control over you. Give it all to Jesus. So the lame man's excuse was that he had no help. There was nobody here to help him when the water was stirred. No one to help him get into the water. And I noticed he didn't say, I don't want to be healed. When Jesus asked him, do, will thou be made whole, do you want to be healed? He asked him the question. This is one of, only, one of the only times I think Jesus ever asked somebody, do, do, you, do you want what I have? And the man said, he didn't say no. He said, I don't have anybody to help me. He didn't realize who was standing before him. He said, I don't have anybody to help me. I'm, I, 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 and, and, when, and then, and then when, I, when I'm trying to get in there, somebody steps over me and takes my spot. How many times did he see that happen? He saw it happen enough times to where he made that complaint 
He's complaining to Jesus. Some, these people are taking my spot. He didn't realize the king of glory was standing right there before him. The God of gods, the ancient of days, the great I am, the originator of life. In John 5, 12 and 14, I think I already said it, but I'll read the scripture. They then asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. A, uh, withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. He said, now you got what you wanted. Treasure it. Treasure it. So the man gave his excuse, and what was Jesus' response? Get up. Rise. Think, think about the power of that. Here's a man been laying 38 years trying to get into the water, and all of a sudden some stranger comes up to him and says, okay, I heard what you had to say. Now get up. Now get up. Wow, I'm floored by that because the guy obeyed, he obeyed it. And that's what God always tells you. He tells you to believe something, to do it, to act on something. He gives you a word to act on. You have, you're part of the equation. You have to act. The command was to do what he had not done for 38 years. So Jesus says, get up or rise. He didn't wait for him to rise. He said, take up your bed. Take up your bed. In other words, and I thought about what this meant. Why did he say, take up your bed? Why didn't he just say, rise and go home? But he said, take up your bed. Here's the, here's the reason why. He's telling him, do not make a provision for relapse. Don't make a provision for a relapse. Y'all hear what I'm saying? In other words, get rid of your bed because you're not going to need it no more. Do not leave it here for a just-in-case. Well, I'll get up, but just in case it doesn't work out. No, no. Take that bed. Get it. You know, I, and, and as I thought about that, I, I, I said to myself, how often do we always have that backup plan? Just in case, just in case, if you're an alcoholic, well, I'll leave a small pint in the cupboard just in case. No, no, go home and pour out all the alcohol. Pour everything out. Pour it all out. There's no just in case. If God has delivered you, then you are delivered. God has healed you, then you are healed. There's no just in case. You are healed and delivered, and you don't need that thing, that crutch, whatever it is, you don't need that thing no more. If it's drugs, go home and flush all the drugs. Burn your bridge behind you, in other words. That's what Jesus was telling him. Burn the bridge. Don't sit there and keep something just in case. Don't leave that bed there just in case. Take it, get rid of it. You don't need it anymore. Rise, take up your bed, get rid of that. There's no fallback plan in this because what God does is permanent. Ain't no fallback plan, amen? amen. Cut off every possibility of ever going back. Too many people always have the backup. They always got a contingency. Well, I'll, I'll hold this in reserve over here. No, get rid of all of it. Listen, I've come to Jesus with my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, everything. I've come to Jesus with all of me, mind, body, and soul. I have everything that I had before, I burned that. That bridge is done. I'm not going back across that bridge again, going back to that old life. I'm done with it, never to go back again. You got to burn that bridge. Too many saints come up, oh yeah, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but just in case, just in case. No, there is no just in case. You're going forward, not backwards. You're not retracing your steps from where you came from. 
People always say, remember where you came from. Well, that's fine, and I understand, the, I understand the whole point of that, but in this case, when you're serving God, there is no remembering where you came from. I don't want to remember where I came from. That was dark times, man. That was some rough stuff. That was a life that I was trying to get away from, I was running from. Why do I want to remember that and go back to it? Well, you know, it's a good testimony. No, your testimony is the fact that you're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Your testimony is that you're a, man, you're a new man in Christ. Old things have passed away. The old, all things have become new. That's what the verse means. Old things have passed away. You burn the bridge. It's passed away. The old man is dead. 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 How many of us, when we have a loved one pass away, then we just keep them out of the ground for the next five years because we just want to keep going back to see them. Most folks would say, something wrong with you. That's a little crazy. No, we don't do that, do we? We take the remains, we have the celebration of life, and then we bury them. The next time they come up out of that grave is when Jesus comes back. But we bury them. Our spirit and soul goes on to heaven, but our bodies are buried. And we, we may go, you know, some of us may go to the grave site. I don't normally visit grave sites. I, I just don't do it. I, it's, you know, they're gone. They're, they're not there. I, I'm not talking to a headstone. Well, mama, no, come on. I, 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 my, my time is better spent talking to Jesus. We bury it. Same thing with the old life. It's buried. The old man is dead. And with, what do you do with dead folks? You bury them. And you never go back to them. And you don't go back to your old life either. And the last thing he told him, rise, take up your bed. And the third thing he told him to do was walk. In other words, he was letting him know, do not expect to be carried. You said nobody, you didn't have anybody to carry you. I'm not going to carry you because you're going to walk. Do not expect to be carried. So when Jesus gave the command to rise, when he gives you that command, he will also give you the power to walk. And not only to walk for that day, but to walk for every day. He'll give you the power to keep going. As you keep your eyes on God, you'll keep going. Now, what does the Bible say? Jesus said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the Bible then says, after Jesus said those three things, immediately, immediately, he got up. Yes. I, just, I, I just marvel at the fact that this man listened to a perfect stranger who said, get up, but it was not just a perfect stranger. It was God Almighty. And it was so about something about the way Jesus said it to him. It was something that re resonated in his heart and his soul. It was something that, 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 that spoke to him, that his faith of 38 years believing that he was going to be healed, he knew somehow inside, he knew that this was the answer to 38 years of faith. Notice that one thing. Notice he didn't say, what'd you say? He didn't respond to Jesus with any words. He responded to Jesus with action. With action. And the Bible says immediately he got up, picked it just in the order Jesus said it, picked up his bed, and he walked. And he walked. Glory to God. That's amazing. Absolutely astonishing. But that's God. And if you don't see that God can act in that way or any way he wants, then you're blind. Because God will do that kind of, he'll give you a command, short, sweet, and simple. And after Jesus said it, the Bible tells us that he went on into the crowd. He didn't stick around and say, you know, hey, are you walking? <laughs> how, 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 how's that feel? Jesus didn't need his ego massaged. He just went away. He just went away. And when he went away, and the 
Pharisees saw this man carrying a bed. And he said, some guy told me to get up and carry my bed and walk. So that's what I did. That's what I did. Later on, they found out it was Jesus, and they were all, oh, man, they were hopping mad. But forget that. Who cares? People are going to get mad at you anyway. Listen, people are going to be mad at you because you're sick, and people are going to be mad at you because you're healed. Somebody's going to be mad at you either way it goes, but you need to get what you need to get from God. You need to meet, meet your appointment. Amen? Amen? Be quick to obey the voice of the Lord. Rise up. Rid yourself of your bed, your crutch, your, your safety net. And walk and keep on walking. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. And that's what we do. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to get us, to change us, to make to have us meet God at that place in that point in time. And when we do, we receive. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? A powerful question from a powerful God. And we should always answer in the affirmative, yes and be ready to leave everything else behind and follow Jesus. We used to sing a church in the old, old we used to sing a song rather, <laughs> sing a church. We used to sing a song in the old church, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. You set fire to that bridge and let it burn and watch it burn and say to yourself, I'm not going back. I've burned my bridge. I'm going on with the Lord. I'm going on with the Lord.